the pale blue dot. Hey guys, how are you going? This is, uh, this is really awesome, by the way. Um, so I actually grew up in the Wolf Gates, which is not too far from here, but funnily enough, uh, my partner and I live in Chelsea Heights. So I took a, a plane here and, uh, you know, adjusted the time difference, so it worked really well. Um, my name is Tom, first and foremost. Um, I'm a counsellor and um, I love to write and I love to drink coffee. So, very quickly, it's just, if, if I had Tinder, I think that's what I would say on it. Um, what we're essentially here to talk about today is quite obviously hurt. So, finding more direction in life. And this is something that I struggled with for 26 now, so five years. I really, really failed to get a grip of how I was trying to orientate myself in the world. And basically it all started when I was 21. So I wanted to be an NFL player from like six years old up until about 21. You know, I identified myself as an NFL player. You could not have Tom and an AFL, you know, without each other in the centres. It, it really like was a part of me, look back on that. And you know, when you're so attached, like when you're you so attached to this identification, anything that or anyone that kind of tussles with it is it's it's very, very intimidating. And so I tried my life down at BFL and you know, I really was kind of living an illusion a little bit like if I'm just gonna be honest with you, I probably didn't have what it took to, to you know play in the AFL. Um but that's not that you don't tell anyone says that. So I get to the BFL and um, I get the path halfway through and it just like it just broke me. You know, I was just crying all the way back. I didn't cry in years, not because I was walking anything, but I just I didn't cry in a very long time. And it was really, really quite fascinating to me because I never thought, you know, I'd be interested in I mean I, looking back I was semi-interested in psychology and philosophy and all this sort of stuff, but you know, if you had asked me again, it would always be about football. And just when I was there playing, I was sleep with a ball in my hand, very strange. Um, it's not a fetish, I guarantee, I still don't do it. But um, yeah, it was all these, you know, it was, it was very strange. Um, so what came from that, and there were a bunch of other things in life that were happening as well, it was just kind of poor timing. And my brain just exploded, my mind, I should say, just exploded. And I developed all these intrusive thoughts, you know, incredible OCD, panic attacks, um, a bit of agoraphobia, but I just didn't understand myself. And I think what really happens, which is really important for your consideration, when we have an aim and when that aim is taken from us, if we're not aware of it or if we're not, you know, conscious of other things, we can lose ourselves. And that, and that really happens to me, you know, getting these incredible thoughts about not health, developing schizophrenia, some, you know, things about my sexuality, just very, very strange things. And, you know, again, my ego attached itself to wanting to become a CrossFit athlete. So, you know, I just trained as much as I possibly could and did all this thing. Uh, my knee went bust, so I was really wanting to identify myself as an athlete. Anyway, my partner and I, we ended up traveling over to France. Um, we live in Bali, we work in Bali, and that's when my identity as athlete was really, it's like, okay, you're not an athlete anymore, okay, because I was traveling overseas, um, there was no ability for me to showcase my athletic potential or lack thereof. And that's when I started reading a lot of death by stuff, you know, having these incredible dreams, um, weird things. But I guess the context around that is what I really need to find in myself was a sense of identity that wouldn't just attach itself to the next possible thing through external validation and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, Siobhan's really cool. I happen to really like her a lot. And, you know, she never liked me because of my athleticism or whatever it was. She just liked me because it was, which is very cliche to say. But it made me start to rethink kind of what it means to be a man, what it means to be a human being. And it eventually led to me writing a couple of books and, you know, dedicating a lot of that to around direction and clarity and purpose. So uh, that's kind of the long-winded way of saying hi, I'm Tom, I like to drink coffee and <laughs> Okay? <laughs> um, so, lots of energy went purpose. Cool. Okay, so what I really wanted to make this uh, workshop call was something very obvious and a little bit humorous. And it really is the idea that you'll get lost if you don't know where you're going. We don't often think about purpose, or at least I don't. You know, we don't often think about 
Um, well, maybe some of us don't. Maybe you guys probably do, and that's why you're here. But you know what life is all about, and all these sorts of things. But it really is the case that when you don't have a clear path, you get lost along the way. Okay, it's a very, very simple analogy that definitely rang true uh, in my experience. And I wanted to talk a bit about the brain before we get into the workshop. But essentially, what we're doing today is we are going to be building a framework for ourselves. Okay, so. I'll talk about the brain in a second. What we're going to be doing, we're going to develop a framework around where you're currently at in life, okay? Point A. And then we're going to develop a framework around where you'd like to be, point B. So we're going to use the perfect day idea around this, okay? Because it is that idea, again, you will get lost if you don't know where you're going. If you don't know where you're going, then you'll get lost, okay? Point B is so important. And there's a lot of neuroscience to actually back this. Okay. So in the 1970s, there was a guy, I remember his first name, um, Gibson, and he wrote this book, and it was all around what's called action and deception theory. It's based on how human beings interpret the world and then act in accordance with that certain stimuli. And the materialists, the objectivists, the scientists will say that you see a chair, you decide that it's going to be helpful for you to sit down, and then you sit down. Okay? But what the psychology, especially what came about in the 70s with action and deception theory, suggests is that we actually have meaning directly attached to what we see. And I'll give you a perfect example of this, right? Okay? And this is going to lead into my next one. Who likes to run? Who likes to run? Someone likes to run. Okay, cool. No, no one over here likes to run. <laughs> Fair enough, with the right. Um, so, when you want to go out in the morning and you want to go for a run, okay, you want to find your running shoes. Okay? So, the purpose, that little micro purpose, is to go for a run. My aim is to currently go for a run. So the tool that I'm going to use to go for the run is the shoes, okay? Awesome, shoes are gonna help me run. The next day, I come back, I'm really sore from running. Hey guys, come here, come here. Uh, super, 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 super. Yeah, very wrong. The next day, I come back from the run and um, my legs are really, really sore, okay? So I don't want to run. And then I forgot, actually, when I came back from my previous run that I was supposed to put my shoes away back in the closet, but I did. Okay, so I feel like a snack. So I'm going to walk from the landing to the kitchen. Upon entering the kitchen, I fall over the shoes that I was meant to put back yesterday. Okay, so because the purpose has changed, runners, yes, they're the most important thing. Today, really effing annoying. Okay, so that's an example of how human beings interpret the world. We interpret the world based upon what is and what ought to be, based upon our subjective mind of thinking. Okay, so whatever you see, you guys came in here, right? Your purpose was to listen to me talk, therefore you knew that a seat was going to be tall, okay? We don't just see things and then react. We actually see things based on the way we can use them. So, what that means is we need to know what we're going to be doing, okay? So, the way I like to do it with my uh, counselling fellas um, is we do point A and point B, and we call point A myth. So myth is essentially who you are and what you do. Because I believe personally that what you do is a perfect reflection of who you are, okay? So, your myth, and there's a lot of research that suggests that writing, expressive writing, specifically writing about secrets or traumatic events, things like that, can really, really boost not only your, your, your mental health, but your physical health as well, your immunity, your immune function. So that's really important. So it's very good to have a clear framework of what you are and where you need to go. Another example for you to it, and please just tell me if I'm talking too much. Um, I'm just fascinated by this stuff. But uh, when you think, actually, we'll do an exercise. Um, you guys want to just close your eyes for a second? Close your eyes. And I want you to think of childhood memory. And open your eyes. Would anyone like to share what that childhood memory was? No one wants to share it? Okay, I'll share one. The first thing that popped into my head was, generally, was when I was in the garden and I weighed my pants and then everyone was. Okay? Uh, I've got no memory, don't worry. But uh, it's the first memory that comes to my head and I can guarantee that the first memory that came to your head would have been an emotionally significant memory. Okay? A really good exercise to do is if you have a memory that's painful, that was prior to 18 months, uh, sorry, before, like longer than 18 months ago, there's probably some attachment to that that's worth working through, okay? But essentially, the function of memory is to help us negotiate the uncertainty of the future. 
So we are always thinking ahead. We're always trying to map the uncertainty of the future. We're always trying to figure out what's behind the vertical corner, what's around the corner, okay? So literally the way we have evolved is to interpret the future. And what's so incredible, you know, Shakespeare said it really well, he said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I learned that from the sisters, and I never let it go. But what's so good about that idea is that life is good and life is bad equally all the time, okay? And what's so good about our current age is that the privileges and the opportunity that we have as people that live in Melbourne, pleasure towns, pleasure towns, we can literally do anything. But because we can do anything, we don't know what to do, okay? Uh, I was reading Brave New World um, by Alex Huxley, and in the foreword of that book, there was a guy that wrote, and if you haven't read that book, I really strongly, strongly recommend you read it, it's really good. It's basically this dystopian future where everyone takes this sober pill, and because they take that pill every day, just draw a couple of similarities based on the way we live, but uh, because people take that pill every day, they don't mind doing the most mundane work. It just doesn't worry them. They're just happy all the time. Okay? And the guy who wrote a foreword to that book, there was a quote that stood out to me. And he said, in a world where everything is available, nothing has any meaning. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to find meaning. We're trying to find purpose in our life. Okay? So when everything is available, there's no hierarchy of value. There's no scarcity. Okay? So, and it's a very easy, easy example, but you go on Netflix, I mean, I'm sure you all know what I'm about to say, but you go on Netflix, it just takes you hours and hours to choose the right movie. But I guarantee you, if you hadn't watched a movie in four years, someone came to a really shitty VHS, you're like, oh, here we go, can't wait, okay? Because there's the, the opportunity that's afforded to us, and Freud was writing about this 100 years ago, the opportunity that's afforded to us here in the West is such that we don't have any clarity about what to do. So the plus side of that, going back to the Shakespeare quote, is that we have to create our own sense of clarity. Okay, our ancestors and their ancestors, ancestors, their clarity and their purpose was to live another day and to hopefully, you know, hopefully their family, the people they love will live too. So we live in abundance now, which is sensational, but it does mean that we need to find our own sense of direction. And I kind of got all that, right? That's all fantastic. But then this workshop is obviously about how to do that. And then I was thinking about your perfect day, and I was thinking about what all the influencers talk about, all the entrepreneurs, and do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. And that is very trite because it doesn't give us any tangibility and practicality. It's like, oh well, yeah, sweet, we we'll just want to party every day. It's cool. Sort of. Okay. The idea behind the perfect day, so we'll do the and the perfect day. Okay, we'll give you some time to write. Um, you can write on your phone as well, that's totally fine. But um, the idea behind the myth is to give yourself a very honest, clear example, interpretation of where you are in life. And the way you do that is you write your current day. Every day I get up, I kiss my loved one, whatever it is, I go to work, because that, that honesty will give you a very clear framework of what point A looks like for you, okay, today, okay? Then, what we do with your perfect day, you write your perfect day as though it was perfect. Now, what that means is, you write a day that's good for that self and then all future views across time. Because what that means is then, because I have a couple of young fellas, I work with fellas predominantly, there's a couple of, a couple of fellas that are like, sweet, I'm gonna wake up, and there's about 20 girls around me, I have all this money, I'm gonna go and party. And it's just like, oh, okay, well, you're missing the point there, just from the planet town, okay? Which is cool, but that's not the idea, okay? Um, what we wanna do is we want to create a perfect day that's good for the you on that day, and then the you of that day for the next day, and then all future use. So that means that your highest good involves Dharma, which is what they spoke about in the Bhagavad Gita. It involves meaningful work, it involves doing the things, it involves sacrifice, essentially. Okay, but what's again cool is that we can choose our sacrifice, we can choose how we want to give ourselves to ourselves and the world. Okay? Are there any questions with that? If I explain that. Please be honest because this is, you know, finding purpose is a big deal. <laughs> you want to go with that? Okay, awesome, cool. So the myth is point A. Okay. Um, well, how much time do we have here? 20 minutes, cool. Okay, so what I would like to do is I want to give you guys literally about 10 minutes, it's a pretty long time, to write your day as it currently is, okay? And you don't have to, I think at the end of it we can, um, actually, no, we don't have to open it up um, to, to discuss it, but it's really important for you to be really honest with yourself 
because a lot of the times, again, you know how we're always thinking towards the future, we write our day as though we like it to be, and sometimes it's really important, that all the time it's important to look and go, no, this is what it actually is, okay? When I was playing football, and I would talk, talk about how I'm gonna play in the AFL and all this sort of stuff, I was never gonna get there, okay? And I had to learn it hard way. <laughs> but when you write your myth, you write it from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, and very quickly, you'll start to feel the emotions as they arise. And if we're always thinking about the future, there's never gonna be a point in time where we're actually gonna get to where we wanna go, okay? But that's fine because that's not the way we're meant to live. We're meant to live in this continued state of positive emotion getting us towards a goal, okay? So what we have to do is when you get to your perfect day, by that time already, just by the pure uh, reality of your, you know, you're a human being, you would have already started thinking about the next big thing, okay? Which is really, really exciting. And then my only request to you guys after this workshop is that you protect that, you know, and you actually tell yourself that I'm worthy of living this life because that's when the trauma and stuff comes into it. That's when we start to have a look at what living beliefs are holding us back, okay? Does that make sense? Excellent. Right, so I wish I had some music or some like meditation music. I don't know if I'm Guys, I'll give you like five to ten minutes, okay? And I want you to write your, your, your myth, write your point A, write how do you currently live today, okay? Take your phones out. Um, expressive writing research says that even if you just do this, this is actually still helpful for your mental health. So just, just looking at it is really powerful. But yeah, let's go for it.
strong greater understanding as to why you become the person you are. So that when those metaphorical holes present themselves to you in the future, you don't fall into them again. Okay? So when you live a certain lifestyle and then you start to analyze that lifestyle, you start to think, okay, well, why did I become this person? And then very quickly, you just give yourself a bit this is you know, an idea around meditation, but what you can do is start to think about when you started living like that, when you started to believe these things, okay? I wouldn't recommend you go so far into it because then you can start to ruminate, which is almost by definition a, a depressive episode. And when we start to ruminate and we don't take action, based on what I was saying before, we live in this what if state all the time. And again, the function of the human being is to act. All the world's a stage, all the men and women are new players. We are here to act, we are here to form. Okay? So that's the idea behind the myth. Okay? Defining yourself based upon who you are. Awesome. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool. How, how did you go with that? Not too challenging? Rough? All good? Lots of smiles? Everyone's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> cool, cool. Okay, so that's the myth there, you guys. That is where you're at. Okay, which is awesome. So now what we want to do is we want to define a really cool future for ourselves, okay? People ask me as to whether or not how realistic it has to be. Um, you know, materially speaking, relatively realistic. I don't want to say you want to sprout wings and start to fly, but I want you to get creative, okay? Um, I was listening to, listening to a fellow talk and he uh, built a, a business in I think in the ghetto area of LA, and all his employees, he was fairly philanthropic, and all his employees, uh, he wanted to get them into the, um, obviously into the manufacturing company. So he, he believed that, you know, belief systems around the one limiting factor, um, or the, you know, start of our potential. And he would go around to all of them and say, hey, you know, if you won the lottery, how much money would you want to win? And I reckon he probably asked 30 people, and they all said a million dollars. Now, a million dollars isn't nothing, obviously, but it's just very interesting to, to get 30 people's approaches as to how much a huge amount of money is, and that's just the same number all the time. So just little things like that, you start to think about how easily influenced we are to believe certain things. And what I'm asking you to do now is to take hold of your individuality and develop yourself and have a think about who and what your perfect plan would be like. Okay? Because Obviously, the goal with that is that once we live that perfect day, we embody that individual, we become that individual, we just grow from there. And that is how we cultivate our own sense of purpose. Because people talk about how you need to find your purpose, and it's just like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to be part of it now. It's, you have to get a little bit creative with it, especially in this day and age when we have those abundance. Okay? So, your perfect day, it has to be you living your highest version of yourself, that's going to be good for you and going to be good for the you tomorrow. So you have to, you know, do the dishes. It's going to be good for you for next week. It's going to be good for you for a month. So the first idea that people tend to think about is, well, how could I do something or build something that I would get paid for at the same time? Okay, so that vocation, vocation idea. And it is cliche, but it's also really awesome because we all want that. We all want to get paid doing things that we just love to do anyway, okay? So that's one example. It doesn't have to be your example for that idea. And what you often find is that when people tend to start going through a sense of purpose and finding meaning in their life, it's not big things up here. It's just this really nice, contented state. People like to read a bit more. People like to spend time drinking coffee. More. People like to do whatever they do, okay? But your idea of your perfect day isn't just going to be that day. It's isn't just, just going to be good for that day. It's going to be good across time. Okay, so the way you write this, which is obviously what you're going to be doing now, is from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, what are you doing? What are you going to be doing? Okay, how are you going to live? Who are you going to be spending time with? Where are you going to live? What kind of job are you going to be doing? You know, have you got plans for the future? Okay, your perfect day. What, what, does that, what does that look like to you? Let's go for it, guys. back to the idea. If you haven't finished yet, please by all means um, finish it tonight or finish it soon as after you have a donut or something um, for a minute, I'm not myself, I'll try to do it. Um, so 
you know that age-old idea, or the age, I suppose, that you buy a blue car and then all of a sudden all you see is blue cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that classic idea. Okay, so this is what we're talking about when it comes to cultivating purpose. Okay, in a way, again, that the brain works akin to our example of the runners with the shoes. Okay, they become tools and obstacles depending on where you're headed. All right, so you now have become someone that drives a blue car. Okay, so that blue car is very meaningful to you. So you see it everywhere. Okay, the best thing about the brain, this is just blue line, you know, when I really got a grasp of this sort of stuff, is that because the world presents it to us, presents itself to us in the form of tools and obstacles, the clearer your perfect day is, the more you will literally start to see the world based upon what's going to help you get there and what's going to hinder your ability to get there. That is the way the brain works. Okay, the neuroscience behind that is absolutely clear. Mirror neurons came out in the 90s and people started to figure out that we attune ourselves to different people, okay? So when you say, for example, that you write down your perfect day and you want to be a billionaire, and that's fine, like, please, by all means, become a billionaire, that'd be awesome, um, and then give me some money. But if you want that, you'll start to see who's going to help you and who's not going to help you get there. You'll start to be a little bit more tuned in to when you watch my friends talk on YouTube, You'll start to be a little less tuned in to when people say negative things and can pull you back. And you know, that those a lot of people talk about how when they really gained, gained a strong sense of self, they moved away from their social groups and they became um, more connected with other people who are all the same way of thinking. Okay, so that idea that you see blue cars everywhere because you yourself now have one and it's very important to you, when you have a perfect day. Everything that is important that's going to get you there is going to present itself to you. We don't just see things, we see things that are going to help us or hinder us. And it just blew my mind when, when, I, when, I, when I read that because it was just, it, it, it's almost, and this is where the beautiful crossover with um, one of the, the interlining similarities between spirituality and, and science exists is because people feel like when God spoke to them, for example, um, you know, that they, they had this mission, they feel like they were doing God's work, they felt like they were, they were living this life they're meant to be living. That's actually true in both scenarios, okay? So the theory you are of where you're going, the more you just will feel like you have been given this, even though you naturally cultivate yourself, which is absolutely phenomenal, you know, especially in this, this world of um, existential loss, because we have all these opportunities, we just don't know what to do with them. So if you take anything from this workshop, it would be to have a think about your Netflix account, or maybe have a think about you know, what TV shows you want before you jump on there. But also have a think about how clear you are with where you want to travel and where you want to go and where you want to be in life. Because the more clarity you have, the better and the easier it will be for you to get there. Okay, so that's it, guys.